So we are going to talk about the clock of the future. I'm going to go so then what does a clock measures? It measures time. And what is the unit of measurements of time is the second, we said. So how long is a second? So a second, more or less, I don't know if you ever noticed, is the period of your heartbeat, right? Just if we had to define the second out of heartbeats of human beings, we we'll, would we'll have some kind of problems because, uh, first of all, it changes with our mood, with the amount of beer that we take and other things. And uh, the other very interesting thing is that human beings are all different. So we will have all different samples around. But if you were all atoms, let's imagine that you are all cesium atoms at this point, you will oscillate all exactly at the same frequency. And the incredible things that was realized at the half of last century is that you could make out clock of atoms that are all equal entities. So if you can imagine a clock made of atoms um, like uh, cesium atoms, like here we are now in London, imagine a similar pub in, uh, in Australia made up with same uh, same, uh, same cesium atoms there, they will all oscillate at the same frequency. And this is a brilliant idea because it could uh, give the possibility to, pe to people to create clocks that will oscillate at, uh, in the same way. So the first atomic clock was built not very far from here at NPL by Jack Parry and Louis Hessen. You see Jack Parry, not that in focus, but that is a very famous, famous picture. And uh, I like the, uh, the sentence that they, they said when they, they called the director to witness their, their invention. They asked the director to witness the death of the astronomical second and the birth of the atomical second. How nice is that? Mm -hmm. Because if you have to think, uh, at the time people knew how to do clocks very well. So there were quartz clocks were already developed, but still, the problem is that this very precise clock needed to be calibrated against something that could be the same everywhere. And still at the time, the second was defined against the Earth rotation. This was 1955. So after that, after a bit of time, they've managed to calibrate their clock against the rotation of the Earth. It took three years of measurement just watching at the moon. And uh, after that, it was possible to define the clock, the second out of, uh, of their invention. It was, I think, 1967. So let's give a look first how an atomic clock works, just to understand a little bit of things. So here you see a clock, and an atomic clock works uh, as more or less whatever is made by the same part of a whatever clock. So first of all, you need a reference, like a pendulum of your clock, right? And then you need something that counts the oscillation of your oscillator. Then you need a counter. And in a cesium clock, the oscillation is obtained putting an electron in a superposition <coughs> of state between two hyperfine levels. So in a very simple term, you can just imagine that you have one electron oscillating. Now, how do we probe this electron? We probe it with an electromagnetic wave. So that is a very, very good thing because we can transform this uh, uh, electron oscillation in uh, something that uh, it, we can measure in a radio frequency that we can then eventually measure, we can transform it in an electrical current and measure it, uh, measure it easily. And then, so a cesium, uh, a cesium clock oscillates at 9.1926317700. So gigahertz, so help me God. <laughs> and uh, I've said all the number. And uh, eventually, this oscillation is used to, uh, to measure, uh, to, define, uh, to define the second. How accurate is this clock? More or less 10 to the minus 13 seconds. So just for a comparison, the course clock that you may have in your computer is accurate at 10 to the minus 9 seconds, so more or less one nanosecond. It loses one nanosecond every second. And this is uh, um, at least four, sometimes five order magnitude better. So what do we do with atomic clocks? Yes, uh, now we have it, we have defined the second, we are happy with that. But probably the most striking application, and this is why we are here today, is the GPS. 
So the GPS is a constellation of satellites and every satellite carries with it an atomic clock. And then uh, I think that you all have uh, witnessed that, uh, have them used the GPS and got lost because the, you lost the GPS, uh, the GPS signal. So what we do without, uh, without the GPS? We can ask to people in the street for directions. This is my message to you all. And then, uh, <laughs> but a part of that, uh, we can try to think uh, um, what we can do in, uh, in a more broader terms. And probably what we will need to do is to try to define what are, in general, the dependency of our present technology to the GPS. So here you don't see it much, but there is this very nice uh, um, study. This is an independent review from the government office from science that uh, had studied in details all the technology that in our days are dependent on the GPS signals. So we, I will go through that on just few of the things, but before going to the details, I want just to give you a brief uh, uh, recall on how GPS works. So we have uh, a number of satellites, every satellite carries with it a clock, and every satellite sends a, an information to your receiver with uh, an information on the time and on the position. So, and by having four of these, uh, four of these points that are known precisely, you can then derive your position in space. You need three coordinates and also in time because you don't have a good clock with you. So, this is basically how it works. So, what can you think that is one of the most, the biggest problem that we can face without the GPS? Maybe for some of your kids or our teenager, maybe it's this. So the Pokemon Go, GPS not found. I don't know if any one of you has experience of this kind of game. That was this pretty, pretty, uh, pretty funny thing. But in any case, it's a game that is based on the GPS position of uh, uh, your uh, um, of the of the gamers on the on the mobile phone. Now this may seem something that is just funny we yeah we are all worried when our kids are complaining and moaning yes it's a big problem but there is something interesting that uh, this kind of games has created that is this give a look to that so this uh, is something that happened because some pretty uh, clever guys actually wanted to cheat at this game and the best, let's say, the ultimate cheating on this kind of game is to trick, try to trick the GPS receiver of, of the gamer by sending a different GPS signal that is exactly very similar to the, to the real one and having then your, your opponent seeing just its, uh, its position jumping somewhere in, uh, on, the, on the screen. Now, we are not very worried about Pokemon Go, but this thing is a GPS spoofing. So, is a device that tricks a GPS receiver. And this device, if you go on this website, you can build it up yourself, because it's, there are all the instructions for building it up, with all components that you can find easily on the internet. So, that means that the vulnerability of the GPS is very big. And it's so vulnerable that a kid, smart one, can build up a system that completely tricks the GPS. And even easier than that is to build up a system that jumps your GPS signal, just sends a lot of noise to your GPS receiver, make it deaf, basically, from the, from the GPS. So the point that I want to make is that GPS is extremely vulnerable because it's a signal that is coming from the satellites, is a faint signal, it can be, you know, that it can be masked from building and everything, it can be properly um, hacked by people. And if it is illegal to hack GPS, it's not illegal to own a GPS jammer, it's not illegal to own a GPS spoofing system. So then let's try to see where 
we use the GPS and what are the critical uh, applications. So now I'm, I will have to talk through that because uh, yeah, unfortunately we don't see it well, but we can do it. So one important thing that the GPS does is that it provides a very accurate reference of time because it has atomic clocks there around. And uh, the very interesting thing is that in this moment you can buy and build with very good GPS receiver and very good um, coarse clock, normal clock, a clock that is much more accurate than most of the commercial atomic clock. So for instance, in our lab, we have uh, our time base is done with a course that is a discipline with a GPS signal. So we have the GPS signal and we get an accuracy of 10 to the minus 13, that is the same of the of the of the of the atomic clocks that are all around but the beauty of this thing is that my device costs a fraction of the equivalent clock that would be needed to have that kind of accuracy so that means and moreover i'm in sync with everything else because it's the global time that i'm taking so that means that in a, in a lot of system engineers are simply using this kind of tricks to put down the cost and to have a very good clock with them where it is used and for instance in the mobile network phone in the US the mobile network in the US is all in sync with the signal out from the GPS that is their time base how do they, they sync the packages now in the UK no because uh, it is illegal for, for them to use that kind, uh, that kind of signal. They are using the distribution of timing like PTP, Ethernet, but this kind of time base uh, we may probably be not enough for 5G for the next generation. So that we, need, we will need to move somewhere at certain point for a different kind of time distribution. What instead is in sync with the GPS signal, even in this country, is the power network. So the power network needs to synchronize uh, all its points for uh, a proper distribution of the electricity, and they are in sync with the GPS. So there are actually GPS receivers. Now, there are other things, and these two applications are only application of timing. I'm not still talking about uh, navigation then there are all the navigation applications. Then you can think that most of the transport uh, supply chain, they have dependency on the GPS, but things like airplane, uh, navy, they have their own uh, systems for navigating. This is true, but I was pretty impressed to read in this review that there is a number of, uh, in case of the airplane, there are a number of airlines and airport that are using GPS uh, augmented uh, devices for the takeoff and for the landing of their uh, of the airplane and this is a big number so because we are talking about Zurich Frankfurt Air Berlin so why this is happening because GPS is cheaper eventually and so it is getting integrated more and more in uh, in all the system now if we want to look even more in the future and uh, think about what will happen next will be uh, do we will need a better gps uh, I mean, the answer is that probably yes because now you don't see uh, probably the picture much i don't know if you are aware of the of the fact that uh, um, amazon is starting their delivery by drone right they are starting a program for delivering things with drones now, of course, these drones will need to find its way and it will have probably a GPS signal. Then you can imagine a, a scenario where you, there is the package that needs to be delivered at your door and you have the kids of your neighbor that with their GPS spoofing that they're just moving it and having it delivered at their door, right? So that we need something in place for avoiding this kind of scenario. And this is even more important if we, we want to have things like self-driving cars, like how important is that we don't have, uh, we get it right. When so can we think about a world where the GPS technology will disappear? But I think no. I mean, even the fact that there are more and more um, countries investing in satellite-based positioning system is telling us 
that there is a big interest in having a better and better technology in the GPS. But probably what we should ask ourselves is how long all this kind of application can stay without a GPS or what kind of backup do this application have without the GPS. And how long they need to stay? It depends on what kind of application we are talking about. If you are a power network, and uh, very likely you want to be able to stay without uh, GPS signal at least for days. So you have to deliver power to a country. So you need to have something, a backup in, pl in, in place. Same thing if you are a, a, a telecom a telecom network, a mobile network, you want to stay, you want to stay, be able to stay without the GPS even more. So you know that very often uh, position can be uh, tracked just with the mobile network. The mobile network is tracking the position of your mobile phone. So the mobile network is then very often a backup already. So it's a backup system for navigating in urban area without the GPS. So you would like to have something that is independent in here. And all these things can be solved, and now we are uh, coming to the point that I want to make, can be solved if you have a portable, accurate atomic clock. Let's say clock in general, but very accurate clock that you can insert in your network a, a kind of uh, a way that allows you to have cheap time, accurate time, directly there. What about navigation? A good clock can help also with navigation. There is a number of design systems that augment the capabilities of the GPS with very good accurate timing. So for instance, if you carry a good clock with you, you could navigate even without seeing all the constellation of the GPS. So there are a number of, of <coughs> ideas that are out there with the, or one thing that you can do with, the, with, with a very accurate clock is that you could take the GPS signal, calculate the precise, uh, let's say, the more accurate uh, um, space positioning out from the GPS and carry it with you for, uh, for a long time. But the ultimate thing that we can imagine for navigation without GPS is to have what is called an inertial navigation unit. And this is something that somehow we already have in our mobile phones. I think that many of you have done this kind of thing with a mobile phone often, yeah, move it. So it, seem, you, it seems a little bit silly to do that. Yeah. What are you doing when you're doing this? You are calibrating the gyroscopes and the accelerometer in your, in your unit. So after that is done. And we, how does it work? So you need a clock. And by knowing the acceleration and, uh, and, your, and, and, your, uh, and your momentum, you can then transform your time in a position. This is how it works. So with that, your, uh, your, your mobile phone allows you to walk some meters, so it depends, not, uh, not much. The military grade uh, um, positioning units are much better than this, but still there is a little bit of, of time to go. They ultimate the ultimate uh, inertial navigation unit is made out of uh, um, atomic, uh, uh, atomic physics. How does it work? It works similarly with a very good gyroscope, a very good accelerometer, and a very good clock. And for how long you are able to navigate without any contact with the <coughs> GPS depends on the quality of all these things. Now we'll go a little bit faster in the um, <coughs> description of the, uh, of the gyroscope and the, the accelerometer. They work with interference of atomic, uh, of, of atomic beams. And yeah, you don't see it much. There is, this is a picture of a very good one, uh, big in, uh, acceleration unit in here by Sirte that is a, a company in, uh, in France. And there is a cheap scale version also that, uh, that we'll get there. But just to give you uh, the impression that these things are actually coming uh, to the market, this is a gravimeter made by AOS, uh, AOSense. So if you can measure the acceleration and you have just a single axis, what you can do is to measure the gravity. And measure gravity is extremely interesting because it allows you to see 
what is underneath things. So those are very interesting devices. Uh, our sense is a spin-off from Stanford, so this is coming from uh, all um, a number of uh, US projects uh, funded, by, funded by DARPA. And, uh, they uh, yeah, they've reached the market a few 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 years ago now it's very nice to see that uh, a similar thing is also presently commercialized by m square that is a glasgow company so uh, there is this is uh, a uk based uh, gravimeter is coming now on the market and is the result uh, of the first uh, bench of, uh, let's say, investment for the gov of the government in, the quant in quantum technologies started five years ago. So uh, yeah, I will, I will come back to that. But these things are coming, on the, are coming, are like that in the moment, some, some things on chip and will be there. So because today we are talking about clocks, let's see how good we can be with clock. How good can be an atomic clock? But the best atomic clock that we can have right now is an optical atomic clock. And this kind of things loses, it's more complicated than my drawing, but in any case, loses one second in the time of the whole universe. So it's really something that once you're there, you're fine with this. How does it work? Why this is so much better than the, the version of the atomic clock of, of Pali and Essen? First of all, because of the very important uh, step, very important innovation that happened in atomic physics uh, that is called laser cooling and uh, was, uh, um, and was um, let's say, um, Stephen Chu, uh, Claude Danjudi and Bill Phillips took the Nobel Prize in 1997 for that. So what did they discover? They discovered a way for cooling down atoms just using a laser. So instead of using brick, big cryogenic things with the laser, you can cool down the atoms. And why this is important? For many things. Regarding the clock, you can simply imagine that if you are keeping a pendulum in a room where everybody is jumping up and down, the pendulum of, uh, of your clock will not be very accurate, right? Because there is a lot of noise. If you are able to cool down the noise of everything else instead, your clock will be much, much more accurate. And this is what they've done. So with their innovation already, um, version of the uh, cesium fountain clock that is in, uh, this in NPL now they, uh, make, has an accuracy of 10 to the minus 16. So we are increasing the uh, accuracy of two, three order of magnitude. And then there is something that belongs more to my field, so I really like it a lot because it's a genius idea, of John Hall and Theodore Hench. They found a way of counting out an optical frequency. Because one thing you have, to, you have to realize is that when you do a clock, if you are able to move your oscillation from low frequency to high frequency, you get much more um, accuracy, much more stability. So then we said cesium clock is around 9 gigahertz. 9 gigahertz is something that you can measure with standard electronics, but an optical radiation oscillate at 600 terahertz. Okay, so we are really talking something that is very fast. So telecommunication are the fastest things that we have in electronic right now. It can reach sometimes 40 gigahertz, 80 gigahertz, an oscilloscope that can measure 80 gigahertz cost more or less on the order of one million of pounds. So we are really talking about uh, big things. So 600 terahertz, we don't measure it with electronics, forget it. But what they realized is that you don't have to count out the optical oscillation. If you are able to have, you have your light, right? You have your laser. If you are able to impress pulses on this laser and you can sync these pulses exactly like this, with the oscillation of your light, and that is a clever thing on how they did it, if you are able to do that, then instead of counting the oscillation of the, of the light, you can count the oscillation of the pulses. And so you are basically realized an optically based reduction gear that goes from this very fast frequency to something that goes slow, that you can measure with your optics. And with them, we have now optical atomic clock, accuracy 10 to the minus 18. 
So this is step four uh, or five order of magnitude. Now, how big is this clock? So if we want to discuss a bit about portability technology and everything, we need to think about the size of these clocks and their accuracy. And the, here comes this graph. So what do we have in the y-axis? In the y-axis, we have the accuracy of the clock. 10 to the minus 7 clock that you can, uh, it supports clock, something that is even not the, the best one. Best clock in the world, 10 to the minus 19 is in here. And then we, ha we have to think about how big are these clocks. So here is something nice and portable, 10 to the minus 3 liters, so it's, uh, it's something that can go on a chip, something small and nice. And over there here we have 10 to the 4, so 10,000 liters, so it's a room, okay? And that is the size of, uh, of the clock. That you, we need the, the best one in the world. So this star represents the optimum clock. That's something that we don't have right now. So I will not going to talk about application that uh, requires this kind of clock because it will be a little bit uh, forward in time. Let's just focus on the uh, application that I've been talking about today. So network synchronization, 5G requires uh, uh, better uh, uh, better um, accuracy than science and timekeeping because you can do a lot of things uh, with big clocks uh, and for instance you can distribute the time you can do timekeeping with uh, every in every places and then um, navigation application uh, for uh, naval land and airport security you need something good but still you can sometimes afford something big just want to uh, point your attention here. This is the where a G good GPS receiver stands. So that is our reference point, what I was discussing before. So we can go very well accurate with a good GPS receiver, with a good force disciplined with a GPS receiver, still with sizes that are not, that are not that big. So we have to mm, compare with that. So let's start with the small, very small clock. This is a coarse clock. You find it in your CPU. This is an interesting point. This you don't see. It's a, a CSAC clock. It's the first chip scale atomic clock that was realized out from uh, a, a DARPA project. So this was a spin-off from uh, from a DARPA project designed exactly to um, provide. Uh, um, uh, US, uh, US military with uh, a backup from GPS, lose loss of time keeping and, um, and, uh, and in general GPS signal is in here. So it's, it's small, still a good GPS receiver like this one performs better in terms of time compared to this clock. But this is extremely small and it's good for, uh, for many, for many applications. Then there is a clock for micro semi. This is also another. This is a cesium clock, and uh, it's also coming out from uh, in another 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 similar uh, project from the from the US to have something small and uh, something small and compact. And then we have uh, um, a clock from uh, Mu Quantum that is a, a, a French spin-off, still more accurate but still big and then it's the biggest thing more accurate that we can uh, we can think about this is a PIB clock and this is a similar thing uh, here in NPL where we have a very good uh, very good clock big but super accurate so it's nice to see that out from uh, the, the quantum technology program there are a number of clocks that are coming out more or less building up, bu building up. This is a prototype in NPL, and this is one of the prototypes that, uh, that we have uh, in Sussex. And this is very recent science. So it's a very recent uh, investment in the, in the UK and, uh, and results that we're getting from there. So I will give you a bit uh, of uh, some pictures at least uh, of the things that happen out from the quantum technology program. And this is uh, a work uh, of the University of Birmingham and the group of Kai Bongs that is di directing, that has directed the quantum technology hub for sensory metrology. And this is uh, uh, one of the clock, they have collaborated to build up a clock for a space program. So this is a real one. It's based on, um, on strontium atoms. You don't see it well, but that is, this is a picture of, uh, of, of a trapped cold atom made by strontium and they should eventually end up 
to something that is on a breadboard like this. And this is one of the, of the clock that instead we have in Sussex, idealized by Matthias Keller. So this is, again, is the reference. <coughs> and it works uh, on trapped calcium ions. On the trap looks like that, so it's, it's small. And one of the beautiful things that he has done is that he made all the system completely fiber compatible. So it's something that you can build up with bits and pieces out from the standard, if you want, uh, telecom, telecom components, and then attach it to that. And then eventually we come to the part that I do for uh, this project, that is working on the miniaturization of the counter, of the optical, uh, optical frequency combs. And I will give you a little bit more of detail with that. So this special laser that we were discussing before that is needed for counting the, uh, the atomic uh, very fast optical frequency is called optical frequency comb. Why it is a comb? But the reason is that uh, is, bec is because of the spectrum that it has. So you can imagine to take your light, you pass it to a prism, like, like, the, the, light of the light of the sun. The light of the sun makes a nice rainbow that is all continuous. If you do this thing with a, a clock, um, an opti this kind of special laser, instead <coughs> you will find a set of equally spaced colors. So because they're equally spaced, they really resemble a bit uh, a comb. So in every, every one of this frequency in spectrum then uh, is, is called, we call it the tooth of the, of the comb. Now, apart, apart of this, what uh, this kind of optical devices makes is that every one of this frequency is known with the precision below hertz. So we are talking about frequency of 600 and hertz that are known with all the digits up to hertz and even below. So that makes this kind of system an optical ruler. And the beauty of this is that if you want to do spectroscopy, you have a comb like that, you take your spectrum, you put your comb here, and then you just have to count the line to have a spectroscopy accurate up to the hertz. What you do with that? Million of things. And those are all the applications that you can do with a the, with the comb like that. That's why they took the Nobel Prize in 2005. Because it's true, you can do the optical atomic clocks, but you could do, for instance, super accurate molecular spectroscopy. So there are uh, devices designed out from, uh, uh, from a comb to measure the breath of people. So you, you just breathe inside uh, a basically a bottle, if you want. You make spectroscopy with this, uh, with this kind of laser, and then you can understand what kind of illness the person has. Super accurate molecular spectroscopy. LIGO experiment. LIGO experiment, you know it probably. So it's a, it, a, it measured the, uh, the gravitational waves. Because uh, with optical frequency comb, you can precise measure spectrum and distances, it has a lot of combs inside that experiment. So, and then uh, telecommunication, all these things where optics is usually used a lot, they all benefit about, about the combs. So a little revolution happened in our field when people realized that you could take a device like that, that at this moment is a, something as big like this, so you, a commercial comb, this is an example from Menlo system, it's uh, 100 kilograms uh, and yeah, it needs 100, 100 watts to work. These kind of things could be done in small chips like that. So basically, you have just to use what we call a micro cavity, that is, in very simple terms, a ring of glass, very small, you put a lot, the, it keeps the light inside this ring of glass, and because <coughs> the light is very condensed, it starts to interact and make a lot of frequency, and you get up something like this. This is a real measurement, so where you have all these, you can see all these lines here are the lines of the comb. It was 2007, first experiment in this field, in uh, EPFL, in... Um, uh, the group of Tobias Kippenberg that is one of the, of the leader of the field, so in, uh, in Switzerland. And then it was a sort of bust for, uh, for, every, for many groups uh, around the world. And this is one of the latest technologies. If, if you see in here, this is a chip 
that provide that makes this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, of combs out of an of a battery realized from the group of Michael Lipson in uh, in Columbia University from US. This is another uh, this is another proof of concept from Nist and Caltech to make uh, this thing small and compact. And this is another uh, this is a prototype of an optical atomic clock made uh, always in uh, from the OE waste groups in uh, in California. So there are a lot of things that are going on, and then there is also us. And this is my experiment, so I put a very big one <laughs> just to show you that this is uh, so. Uh, you see in here, so this is, uh, this is our chip, and in here there is, the, there is, the, there is the, the ring of glass. And this ring of glass is fabricated on a silicon compatible chip, so you could really put it with, the, with your electronics. What we realized is that we managed to make the, the most efficient things in here, and that, uh, that, is, in, that is in literature, and that basically uh, means that now we can send to my colleague Matthias Keller downstairs a signal out of this resonator that he can actually measure because one of the, with this is this was one of uh, of the big problem in the field yeah and i think that uh, at this point i just wanted to give you a bit of, of perspective so gps timing on, so we have seen there is a lot of technology that needs to be uh, that needs to go there to uh, have independence. So the first thing to be realized, we need the clock that are good and are small on a compact shape that you can use in many of the applications uh, that I've seen before. Portable clock, optical clock, we need two important parts. So the counter, optical frequency combs, as I show you, optical frequency combs are basically already on chip. So something that you could have directly in your mobile phone. We just have to wait for the atomic guys, for the atomic scientists to make their reference small enough. So at the moment, super, so the, the top of this thing is, uh, uh, is something that is in a rack, okay? A, a rack is where, is where we are, but this is already portable enough for a number of applications. I'm sure that they will, uh, so there are examples of things that are going smaller and smaller. Atomic science, uh, uh, there is, let's say, it's a, it's a similar, it's, it's a broader atomic science that you need to realize atomic gyroscopes and accelerometer, and they will, they will come there. So with that, uh, there will be a unit that is completely independent from GPS, uh, also, for, uh, also for navigation. And uh, with that, I just wanted to make a little bit of advertisement of our Quantum Technology Center. Uh, many, many people working in here, and uh, please feel free to take some of the, of the brochure to have a, have a go with what we do. Yeah, thank you.